the technology today, you, you might want to say, oh, you know, it's evil, blah, blah, blah. But it's also leveled the playing field. It means a little guy like me can compete and go against big guys. And I don't need, I don't need a bank. I don't need a corporation. I don't need a publisher. I can go to the crowd. Hey, crowd, do you want this? If you want it, great. Put some skin in the game and let's create this together. Justin Rhodes is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Justin is a permaculturist, film producer, author, and teacher. He helps folks learn to work with nature to produce their own sustenance so they can live a more abundant life. Justin is a seasoned homesteader, having enjoyed many years of practicing beyond organic and permaculture methods on a 75-acre family farm near Asheville, North Carolina. Justin trained under the highly accredited Geoff Lawton of PRI Australia for his permaculture design certificate and has studied natural chicken care under popular author Pat Foreman. Justin founded Abundant Permaculture out of a love of teaching and the sustainable movement, where you'll find exhaustive permanent permaculture articles, plentiful photos, cinematic educational films, and business tips and tricks through Abundance Plus. We're here to talk about a couple things today. So Abundance Plus for sure in Justin's upcoming book, The Rooted Life comes out March uh, 2022. So next year, only three months away, really. Now we're uh, three, four months away. Now we're heading into December. And uh, I am just so excited that you took the time out of your busy life to, to join us here today. Welcome to the show, Justin. Hey, thanks for having me. It's so good that you could make it. If anybody who has seen your vlog, your YouTube channel, uh, no, you're a busy man. <laughs> Very busy. Um, so you, you, as a family of five, am I right on that? Oh, no, uh, seven. Five kids. Seven. About, yeah. Five kids. Yeah. Wow. My goodness. Okay. So family of seven and uh, a big farm to run. I have to start out with the usual question. How in the heck have you weathered this two years of craziness on the farm? Has it affected you a lot? Has it come in at all? Not just COVID, not just the crazy inauguration, not just all the other stuff, just in general. No, I, would, uh, I laugh at that because there was quarantines all over the world, right? And I guess still are, but um, I'm just like, welcome to my world. I mean, we, we've been quarantined quarantining for 15 years welcome to homesteading i mean you stay at home we do everything at home i mean we, we, we homeschool uh i work from home we even home birth and uh we grow most of our own food pretty much all of our own meat and even whole foods delivers out here so where do we gotta go i mean we we're, we if we could get the dentist to come we'd be set but otherwise, we, we got to go to town for the dentist. And then, I mean, our, I'm telling you, the last two years is funny because we'll buy the kids town shoes is what you call them. And then they have their farm shoes where they go barefoot. But we have town shoes. They have literally grown out of the town shoes before they maybe wore them once. You know what I mean? So that, that's our last two years. So we're happy. We, we are the most socialized homebodies, you know. But just because you're homesteading and staying home, though, doesn't mean you don't have this rich, abundant. Uh, lifestyle so once a month we'll invite our homesteading friends and our homesteading friends are within four, uh, 45 minutes to an hour to come over and we'll have a once a month to get together and that's about right when you're 40 years old it doesn't take long for a month to come around and you, we're so you, you we're busy enough running the farm that that's kind of a perfect uh, once a week is too much uh, but once a month is good and it fills it fills the soul and so you know with what we do we're very open in our lives and so we have people coming in and out of our lives even more than once a month but uh we just bring the the social party to us and and 
because I've had the the for, fortunate blessing to to watch your episodes and that I, I know with your with your health issues and stuff and, and things you've gone through. Are you doing okay? Is it on is on are where you say it's on the upward battle or is it still a daily struggle? How are you doing just yourself and, and the family? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking that. And for those that don't know, I got uh, a food, what is it, GI infection, Rebecca, Campylobacter, from handling raw poultry, pr- pr- uh, not washing my hands properly. I'm sure, you know, just having getting some manure on that or some somehow getting in my mouth and came down with Campylobacter. And then there's a rare one to five percent chance you can get what you call reactive arthritis from that, which is like a severe case of arthritis. And it, it went through a tour throughout my entire body, pretty much all the joints, at least all the major joints. And there were points where I could literally not walk. I mean, I had to, uh, there was a point where I had to use a walker to get outside, to get in my Kubota, to go out and supervise the chores, literally. And that was months. That was, well, we're on month five and I still have a lot of pain in my feet but it's very doable and I will have, I'm starting to have where I have good days. Like my joints will move now. Maybe there's some pain in my feet. Left. I'm milking again. I mean, there was two, three months I wasn't able to milk. We milk by hand. So my kids had to step it up and I'm doing much better. Uh, slowly and surely, at least I'm walking. Thankful for that. Sure, there's some pain there. I have some good days. And so I see some light at the end of the tunnel, even though we're at that like you know, five months, what it's supposed to take. I mean, heard, you, you know, I could still continue to have symptoms for a year, but I'm already custom to living with pain because I have uh, chronic Lyme disease and that's where it accumulates in my feet. So it's probably feeding off of each other a little bit. There is my guess. And uh, there are moments now that the, the pain is quiet enough that I can ignore it. I mean, there was a point where I could, I would go out and do on the farm, but it was constantly nagging me. But there are, there are points now where I'll be out on the farm and be like, oh, hey, I just did this and that chore or project. And I didn't think about my pain. So that's good. Because living and thinking about pain all the time is just miserable. I love your tips that you give on, on abundance plus courses. and, And when you talk about it in your episodes as well of how to deal with that and also manage it and get through it. And, and uh, uh, you have a wonderful support structure uh, uh, around you, surrounding you. And I, I love that uh, you, you come out and said, you know, this, this homesteading lifestyle is not only homeschooling, it's home birthing, it's home staying. It's, you know, you guys are 24 seven, but you also have that social aspect. A lot of people, you know, get on these uh, social media thing, uh, viewings where they view a vlog or something on social media. And then all of a sudden, oh, that's what I got to do. And they don't see the full picture. And what I love about your whole family, <laughs> I see Becca on the couch back there. She, uh, uh, hello. And, and it's so good to, to, to see the interaction of that. Matter of fact, I'm so jealous of you guys as Thanksgiving. It was, uh, I'm in Germany, so there's not a lot of Thanksgiving celebrated here. It was, yeah. looked absolutely fabulous, all your cooking and what you guys did. So hats off to that. But, uh, but that you really give that behind the scenes. Here's the reality, but the reality is really good. Uh, I, like, come on over because it, it's, it's not that, but you're, you're also saying it's not a bed of roses. You know, I've got some other yeah. things that, that most people don't have. So I, I, I'm like that, that honesty and the behind the scenes kind of in, in, glimpse into your life that you, you've given many because many don't get to see that. I as well do um, grew up six generations of agriculture and organic farmers. And, and I've dealt with some of the same issues you have uh, as well, Lyme disease and um, arthritis. In Germany, they call it classic arthritis. It's a son of a gun. It's really, it's really rough. And so it's nice, nice to see those things. This whole journey for you began around 2015, am I correct, as far as uh, vlogging and moving in that direction or clear me up on that? Yeah, you're pretty close to that, isn't it, Rebecca? Because we we started vlogging in 2016 of January. Yeah. So yeah, we would have launched our business in 2015 with uh, our first February. course, 
uh, which was permaculture chickens. And we launched a Kickstarter for that. And that came from, you know, we, we, we had this Lyme disease, we were doing market farm and we we're doing fine, but then the, the symptoms of Lyme disease essentially slowed me down. And I'm like, I still want to be in this movement though. So what can we do? And I, a mentor had picked, give me the book four hour work week by Tim Ferriss, which is a business uh, book it's about online business and creating content as a business. And I'm like, Oh, that, 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 that this could work. And eventually led to a Kickstarter. You know, you, you mentioned training or in my intro, you talked about training with Jeff Lawton and you've, you spent some time with him too. So uh, when I actually got into permaculture because I was not able to do it all the way I was homesteading, the chickens over here, the garden over here, uh, the cow over there, and them having really nothing to do with do with anything else that's like the classic homestead permaculture or uh, classic homestead stamp you know if you go pick up a, a homesteading book you know it's kind of compartmentalized and that was a lot and i felt in my heart that these things I, I really even maybe use the word connected i feel like these things could be connected but i had no idea how or why or what that meant until a friend showed me a jeff lawton video and then he's got the chickens in a in a temporary electric net, uh, tilling and scratching and pooping, and then they move on and then he plants the garden. So then it's like, oh, whoa, okay, that's what it is. It's one, it's one thing. <laughs> it's so connected, it's one thing. It, it, it's not the chickens over here and the garden over here. They're actually one, you see. And so uh, the chickens have benefit for the garden and the garden, garden has benefit for the chickens. And I went and I said, eventually, we like bit the bullet. We're like, we gotta go study this and have a career change. We went to Jeff Lawton's, they tuna farm. you couldn't get any further away. I'm in North Carolina, literally, if you dig a hole through the, through the earth, you don't come out in China, uh, you come out in Australia. And that's where I went, <laughs> literally. I, I took a tax, tax, re we had no money at the time, so I took a tax refund, a tax return, and went to Australia. And you get trained there as a permaculture designer but one night they showed a movie called Permaculture Orchard and it made an impression on me because it was so educational, but it was also cinematic and beautiful and entertaining. And I thought, oh, you know, that kind of planted a seed in me. And then getting home, the mentor handed me the four hour work week and we're like, the, the concept of four hour work week is create a piece of content that is a video and a companion ebook and go for it. And we came down to chickens. I'd been doing chickens for a long time. And so, you know, thanks to that inspiration, we launched our first product 2015 on a Kickstarter and to give people hope, you know, I, I, I had seven people following me at the time. I had seven people on my email list and that was just from posting it on Facebook or something, but going into this Kickstarter, that's the tools we have today. That's one thing that the four hour work we taught, taught me is the technology today. You, you might want to say, oh, you know, it's evil, blah, blah, blah but it's also leveled the playing field. It means a little guy like me can compete and go against big guys. And I don't need, I don't need a bank. I don't need a corporation. I don't need a publisher. I can go to the crowd. Hey crowd, do you want this? If you want it, great. Put some skin in the game and let's create this together. And if you don't, nobody gets charged, blah, blah, blah. And, but I didn't know how to do a Kickstarter. When I picked up the four hour work, I didn't, at the time, Facebook was popular. I didn't even have a Facebook. I mean, I was just not connected. I was just not online to give you an example. And so, you know what I did? Uh, I said, well, how do you do a Kickstarter? I went to the library. Guys, you remember those? Went to the library, checked out a book on how to do a Kickstarter. I also went online and picked a couple of articles. And between two articles and a book on how to do a Kickstarter, I formulated a plan. And 30 days before my Kickstarter, it was basically my job. You know, I would do the farm chores, uh, but then I would come in and start working on this launch and then going into this launch. And remember, I knew nothing. I was just going off these books and articles and went into this launch. And in 30 days, uh, from seven people on my email list to 1,200 people on my email list, because we had 1,200 customers through Kickstarter, something like that. 
and raised like $35,000. And, and, and from there, just continually studying online business and things like that. And if I had a question, we are in the time of, you can go ask Mr. Google Pants or Mrs. Boobtube. The world information is at our fingertips and we can play with the big dogs with very little money. Exactly. I love, I love how you phrase that. And those are all also um, inspirational four hour work week from Tim Ferriss is, is pretty well known, but I, I think it's the combination of the way you look at it and that you find those resources, whether they're the library or Google pants uh, um, <laughs> online um, that, that you made yourself wise enough and had the support of, of a great family and, and wife to really say, hey, let's do this. We've got our support. Let's let's make it happen. Um, I, I absolutely love that. There, you know, there is that that journey, and it's uh, now uh, the last I look at your your YouTube channel, it's nine hundred and something thousand subscribers you're you're pushing that 1 million mark i mean you've probably already received numerous little plaques from the youtuber pants uh, company uh, uh, um, what is the what is the, the the drive and the story that you're getting from these subscribers what is keeping you going what what, what is the response what are you seeing what are those 900,000 people yeah coming over and over to to your site for those we touched on it a little bit before so when the the concept the concept is getting from the four hour work is basically an online marketing is if this is going to be a career you 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 crank out content and it's free it's a wonderful business model because you're getting all this content for free. I mean, it could be on uh, YouTube. It could be uh, before YouTube, it was a blog. So I was writing a blog. It could be podcast. What do you like to do? You like to talk and interview? Okay. You're doing a podcast. Uh, somebody else might like to make movies. Then think about YouTube. And then if you like to take pictures and write really nice, poetic, thoughtful things, then it's Instagram. And you're, you're basically putting out this content and, we were blogging with a B. Remember that? That's not so popular anymore, but I would write these epic articles and it was great. And it, and I found ways to market those articles and get it out there. And at the bottom of each article, I'd have a way for people to join my email list. And I was building the audience. And, and eventually what you do is discover a need. I mean, I always say selling is a service. So you, you find needs in the world, great business, is solving problems. It's not this used car lying, scheming type of things. If, if you're a good businessman, if you're a gentleman, you, you do the right thing and you solve problems and people trade you for that often in a monetary way. So going into that, writing these articles, but then what happened was I would write these and it was good and we were getting traction. Rebecca would edit those for me and it was kind of like, hey, Rebecca, did you edit that? Oh, yeah, okay, okay. I forgot about, you know, it's, it's, and she, when you edit something written, it's just, it's just not fun. Like she never smiled or laughed or whatever. And I always have, I have young kids. If you see, this is my office, guys. I'm not into the, the office has got to be in a separate room. This is the dining room. You see the people in the living room? And I like it that way. I'm okay with the distractions. I'm, okay, I'm the man who will insist that my kids go to work with me. My dad used to take me, he was a traveling salesman in orthodontics and he would take me and we'd just wait in the waiting room or out in the car or when we were older at Six Flags, which is like an amusement park. <laughs> uh, he took, and maybe that rubbed off on me. And so the kids have got to be here, but when I'm writing, you're, you're, you're deep in thought, writing's difficult and a kid comes up and interrupts, it's, it's difficult. It's get, difficult to get back on track. When we found out, Rebecca caught a viral video. Somebody, some family vlogger had put out a video where the man had snuck a pregnancy test in the toilet and found out that they were pregnant. And so usually the woman is, is revealing to the man we're pregnant. 
but this was backwards and, and he had found out. And so this video had gone viral and she had became interested in these people and saw that they had some other content and it was on YouTube. And every day they put out this video and it was just about their life. It wasn't this epic story. It wasn't well put together. When I looked at it, it looked like he was filming on his iPhone or something. And we're like, we could maybe do that. And long story short, we, we got us a little camera. I think it was a, it was a Canon, what was it, Rebecca? Uh, a Canon G7X. And we said, let's just try it. And our goal was to uh, make people laugh and, and that they would learn something. And so we just documented our lives. We didn't really create, but we documented. We just documented what we were already doing on the homestead because we thought it was interesting. We would have FedEx drivers, you know, have to stop in the middle of the road. We're on a dead end road. Stop in the middle of the road because we're bringing the cows in, you know, for the milking or whatever. And I'm, I, you know, a calf busts the lane and you get it out and I run out and heard it. This, this really happened. And he's like, oh man, this is so interesting. I don't know if he said, do you film it or something like that? But he was so interested and intrigued. He wasn't inconvenienced. He was entertained that he was stopped in the road. And it was kind of like, oh, this life is interesting, even though we've been living it for 10 years and it can be awful boring sometimes. I mean, put the chickens up every night, let them out every morning, milk the cow every single I mean, that can only be exciting for so long. But to somebody who's not used to that, that is exciting. And we put our vlogs up and you spoke to it earlier. I think what how people resonate with us is... We went from permaculture chickens, which was very textbook. I mean, if you if you watch it, it, well, one, it was my first performance. So it wasn't that great, but a serious as a heart attack. And if you watch a vlog of us now, you are going to learn something, but you're also going to laugh. You're also going to emerge. You're also going to win. You're also going to like wince every once in a while, you know, because uh, I don't know everything. I might be really good at chickens, but I'll, every once in a while, I'll still even mess up with them. Uh, we just got rabbits. I know nothing about rabbits. So all the people with rabbit experience, I'm sure are like, ah. I even have a cooking segment on our show called, I call it the burn it up cooking show. Cause I'm always like, you always see these Martha Stewart cookie cutter shows where the ingredients are already in a glass bowl and it's all ready to go. But come on, everybody's struggling to find the oregano. Where was it? The kid took it off over there. A kid's coming in and spilling it. The kid wants to help and they're dumping all this in there. You, I'm really not that great of a cook. I just know how to read. So I follow the instructions and sometimes I got to ask Rebecca and that, uh, putting that in there. I can remember, here's the apron wearing permaculture chicken ninja master. You know, I'm supposed to be this expert and we're documenting our lives on YouTube and a chicken gets ill uh, and it, it's raining and the one, all the chickens are up and the one chicken's out. And if you know anything about chickens, they do not like the rain. So something's wrong. What's wrong with this chicken? And we go and, you know, we kind of look at her and feel her and, you know, she feels like maybe she's a little clogged up there. And we go in line and we, we talk to Mr. Google Pants and he says, uh, she's egg bound. And what do you got to do for that? Well, you got to do an olive oil bath. You got to put them in warm water and, uh, she still might not make it because um, the egg's stuck or something. And well, we thought, you know, well, this chicken's old. It didn't happen to anybody else. You know, everybody else seemed fine. Why is it happening to her? Okay, let's, let's call this chicken. Well, we open that chicken up and it's just this weird material. You know, it's just like this weird soft uh, enough to fill up a softball full of just this yellow soft i mean i was thinking tumor or something and uh so i mean we didn't even eat her we didn't we didn't know we didn't feel like it was safe i think we put her in the woods and we we published that video and i think i caught I, well i know I called, I called it putting this fat hen out of her misery and that vi i went after i published that video I had to take a nap. I was so sick. It was so vulnerable. It was so like, I shouldn't, that shouldn't happen to an expert. That shouldn't, that shouldn't happen to me. You know, long story short, found out we, that chicken had probably, Lily was sneaking into the feed and feeding the chickens extra. And that chicken was actually fat. I mean, we, 
So that really shouldn't happen. <laughs> but still, I mean, it happened to the one chicken. It didn't happen to the other. So I, I was okay with it because uh, she couldn't handle it. Everybody else could. So, you know, but still, at the time, you don't know all that. You're looking back and you, and you just have to pose this uncertainty. But you know what happened? When I woke up from my nap and went to the comments, I was dreading and I was like, oh, they're, they're gonna, I thought it was going to be this big exposure video. Like, you fake, I'm leaving. You, you, you act like you know everything. It was yeah. not that. You know what it was? It was, thank you. I appreciate this so much. It's good. To, it, it makes me feel empowered. It makes me feel less bad. Uh, because people's plants, people's animals, they die. It happens to everybody. And sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes you don't know whose fault it is or what, what it is. And that gave per per people permission to fail. This is Lily, everybody. Hi, Lily. We just uh, heard your chicken story. Yeah. Remember when you were feeding those chickens? Sneaking into the van. She was little. She was a little tiny. Gosh. What did I do? That was five years ago. What did I do? You overfed the chickens. <laughs> she don't remember. All right. So that was fun. But the, the, that, that I think is the key that, that, that happened for the first time and on, on YouTube for homesteading. So there was a lot of textbook stuff there, but I think we were the first to bring in the real life and people were really related. To it. And even to this day, we'll, Rebecca and I will follow health experts or something like that in a, in, in a semi related field. And it'll be so frustrating if, if, if when they don't share that they cheat, that they have a cheat meal or that they failed and went for the peanut butter and chocolate. You know what I mean? It would bring me great comfort if they knew, if, if I knew they too struggled, you know, if I, if I'm trying to stick to a certain diet because of my Lyme, you know, we're, we're, I'm eating mostly carnivore. So I mean, a lot of meat, and a little bit of fruit, but I like the peanut butter and chocolate. You know what I mean? And to, I feel like sometimes when I'm watching an expert and they don't share those moments, it's actually defeating and it actually feels unachievable. So now I'm seeing it from both perspectives and I appreciate when Joel Salatin or Jeff Lawton or, or somebody like that could say, you know what? The cows got out because we forgot to turn on the fence. You know what I mean? And this is yeah. what we that happens. <laughs> We've seen that many times, you know, where, where they sometimes do that. Uh, it's rare in some of the bigger stars, obviously, but that really sounds like you're building a community and it's a back and forth. It's not just a one way street that a lot of them are saying, Hey, thanks for, for sharing that honesty. And I'm sure many others are coming back and saying, Hey, I've experienced that same thing. What if it was this or what if it was that, you know, and, and uh, people like that engagement to know that they're not alone in their universe or, or wherever they're at. The only one is experiencing that because we, we tend to go to the Google pants and say, Hey, is anybody else having this issue? I mean, I'm sure yeah. as you, you uh, um, I, in one of your episodes, Becca was really saying how she went out to help you research Lyme disease and, and uh, you know, was reading the books and just, I mean, it's overwhelming the amount of information. It's, you know, a doctorate degree just in Lyme disease to figure out, you know, what's going on and some of these, these things. So yeah, that I, I appreciate you sharing how, how that community and, and the response and, and, and how that works. I, I, want you to tell us a little bit more about why abundance plus what what it's set up to to do and designed for um and what the resonance is coming how, how how's it going so far and uh uh how how many different uh channels or i don't even know if you call them channels uh yeah. creators you have in there other farmers uh, that are probably also part of this group of homesteaders that you mentioned earlier in our discussion. Yeah, well, it came from a pain point, of course. And so when I'm starting out, it's even before Mrs. Boobtube and Mr. and, and uh, uh, Google Mr. Pants. The, it's before all that. 
And all we've got is books. I mean, we were fortunate enough to pick up the right books. Uh, Joel Salatin, Elliot Coleman, Bill Mollison. We were fortunate enough to find the right books, but reading those books and then going out and doing them, there's still some gaps. There's still some specifics. I mean, we had somebody on our video podcast the other day and they were talking about bringing, it was, it was uh, Roots and Refuge. They had talked about bringing a cow home and uh, in the trailer and she had slipped in her own manure on the way home and was down by, by the time they got home. There's no textbook that tells you what to do in that situation. That's a great example of what I'm talking about here. So there's these gaps there. So you need this information. And now the information's there. So for me, it was in books, but sometimes I wanted to see it, all right? And sometimes I needed to fill in these gaps. So I, I felt like after I had done bled, sweat, and cried enough and figured this thing out that now the technology is there. I can create videos to help and give people that visual. And now with the internet, you know, I could create a video every day. A book can be, I mean, Joel's cranking them out more than anybody I know. And it's maybe one a year, one every, one every year and a half. So compared to what we can do with di digitally, though, I could make almost 400 videos to one book. Okay. So a lot more visual there to be able to help people. But then what about those gaps still? Because you can't, I don't think Mrs. Boob Tube's got any book, uh, any videos on what to do if your cow's slipping around and, and poop and she's laying down, you know, and getting up. So I needed a, I wished I had an uncle. I wished I had a food growing uncle that I could call or text or talk to at the family reunion. Actually, I wished Joel Salatin was my uncle and he wasn't. So I learned the hard way and eventually got to a point where I could put out the, I was putting out the content, helping others, still being vulnerable and real and admitting, I don't know everything. And if somebody asks me something, I don't know, or I look it up myself and help them out, help them with some research. But the idea here is you, you talked about it. If you, if you asked Google a question about, you had a concern, uh, can I leave my eggs out on the count or how, how long do eggs last? before they go bad. Well, you're going to get probably, well, you're going to get millions of answers. There's going to be millions. There's going to be literally millions. And so who do you trust? What do you trust? So you have to, there's a need to have an authority that you can trust. So often I remember I would uh, maybe type in a recipe or some health remedy, and then I would add the blogger. So early on, when we found uh, the Prairie Homestead or other homestead, uh, Fresh Eggs Daily or somebody like that, Fresh Eggs Daily is like doing e uh, chickens and stuff. So I might say, why are my chickens not laying eggs? And then I would add Fresh Eggs Daily so that I would only get those results. So you have to like pick this, you have to pick away because you'll get experts, brilliant, genius people that disagree. And they both might be right. <laughs> one might be right, one might be wrong. They both be, might, both, might both be wrong. But for your sanity, <laughs> you have to place your trust somewhere and, and, and follow something. So uh, you see what's happening here? You need video. You need uh, to fill in holes in the gap. You need an authority. And so I finally got the guts to, even though I didn't know everything, to establish myself as authority by producing these videos and encouraging people to come along, come along in the journey. And there'll be many comments. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes ask, yeah, I don't know anything about mechanics and I'll know that. And it, it's to the point where I can even say, I'm sure someone will tell me in this video, you know, right now we're trying to find springs on our property. I don't know anything about that. I don't know how to, you know, get it into the spring box and get it down to the house and have that be an alternative because we do have the well, but it would be nice to have a shut off and be able to tap into the spring if we had to, or if something happened to the electricity. Well, somebody in the community reached out 
and said, I was in 30 years in water and he had all the right terms and he's come out and we've hunted springs and he knows exactly what to do when we find a spring. The point is I created abundance plus to meet that video need. So our vlogs are entertaining. They're, they're edutainal. Okay. You go there and you're entertained and you learn something and you laugh, but really if you, if you watch us water our pigs, it's entertaining and fun. And we fill up this 50 gallon barrel and we got a nipple water on it. But if you actually want to do that, it would be helpful to have a one minute video, how to set up a pig water. If you really want to do that, if you want to go beyond entertainment, you're inspired and now you want to do it, go to Abundance Plus and type in how to make a pig water. It comes up with plans and link. the video comes up but then with plans and links to all the parts to go and get it. And then if you're in there building that pig water and you have a question like, oh, well, this didn't say, does it go, does, do you put the nipple, maybe somebody doesn't, aren't sure. Do you put the nipple water a, a foot up, four inches up? Does it matter? A foot and a half, does it matter? Well, then that's when you need a food growing uncle. So folks in Abundance Plus have the option at the premium level to literally text me. They can text me and I check it every 24 hours and they can say, does it matter how high up the nipple water is? I mean, nobody's ever asked me that, but I could see how that might could be a question for somebody. And maybe that's a good example. And so then I've, be I've become their uh, food growing uncle. So we've solved that. We've given them video. We've given them... Um, and we filled in these gaps and I've been this authority and what abundance plus has become is met these major problems. So there are some major problems. You, you, you need inspiration to get started. Sure. And that may or may not have been me, but you've, you've been inspired, but as Zig Ziglar would say, he's a motivational speaker. You know, motivation is like bathing. You have to continually do it for it to work. <laughs> you can't take one bath and be clean, be clean forever, right? You got to do it every day or once a week or whatever it is. Go, go, get, get your bath. So get your dose of inspiration. So you said you've been in Abundance Plus and you've, you've, it sounds like you've watched our show Rooted. So that's very inspirational. You, we showed uh, another show that's in there called Wilder Still. We showed it this weekend at our party and there was somebody there that just, has some chickens, you know, and I don't know if they would call themselves a homesteader or anything, but when we got done watching while they're still that they were like, this makes me want to really go and do that. But for those people that are doing it, it also makes you want to continue because it gets real old, putting the chickens up every night, letting them out, you know, leaving the, uh, and then, and then you have another problem. So once you, gardening socially acceptable, Oprah has a garden. It's totally cool. It's not weird. It's even at the White House, okay? Yeah. And what happens though? You yeah, get... it used to be at the White House. Now there's a, a tennis court or something. Oh, there. okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think the Obamas had a garden, didn't they? Yeah, they did. I think they had a little organic garden. So, so when, once you go from, you have some success in the garden, then you get a chicken. You get some chickens. And like Pat Foreman says, chickens are a gateway drug to homesteading. So, then you're, then you're on the run, but you need that continual inspiration. And now, now you've been inspired, but now you need some know-how you need, all of a sudden you get pigs, you know, and you need to know how to do this, uh, set up a water or set up a fence or whatever, or when to harvest or how to harvest on farm or whatever. And you need to know how to design. So you want to take my des des uh, permaculture design course in there. And then there's one more, and we've talked about it a little bit here. So you've got inspiration, but then you've got know-how, but there's one more and it's very important. And this is the key to lasting and that's community because in its nature, homesteading can be lonely because homesteading, home, you got to stay home to be successful. Joel will talk about this all the time. To be a successful market farmer, you really need to be home because if you're off and going and doing things, you know, and the cows get out, you're going to have bigger losses as if you were there and able to nip it in the bud. And there's also advantages to not having to drive to work. And, uh, you know, if you're 30 minutes to work and 30 minutes back, 
Well, that's an hour. So there's some advantage of gaining another hour and maybe even monetary that, you know, with that extra hour gain, helping offset some of the loss of, of giving up the town job. But, and now, you know, people can work from home more than ever. I mean, we're, we're you're in Germany. I'm in North yeah, Carolina I'm in Germany. Yep. and this is coming through clear. And we're going to share this with thousands and thousands of people. And we're actually creating community right here. And people need that. They, they feel like you're crazy because if you start around here anyway, I don't know what it's like in Germany, but if you, if you start to grow your, if you get chickens, you're bats. Okay. You, you're all your friends are like, huh? You know, your friends and family. And all of a sudden you're this, you're the, go ahead. Except for the ones that have, have had fresh chicken eggs uh, and fresh right. chicken meat and and, the, and and been there for the harvest and 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 seen that they're like oh you got any extra eggs can i come over yeah. and, and then they'll set up the schedule because they they realize it's a lot fresher than the market yep you're gonna you're gonna win those folks over when you feed them and then they'll understand it and it's coming around actually if, if, if there's anything good coming from COVID is it's making homesteading cool again. Okay. Cause one, it's been necessary because for the first time in, in my American experience, food shortages have entered my vernacular. I'm 43 years old and that's never been an issue. I mean, very privileged in that way, but and, I, and I'm not talking like individual, like for individual impoverished families. I'm talking about like, there's no chickens at the grocery store for anybody. Okay, that's happened. And that was one of the first times. So now, you know, uh, that's a real issue. And suddenly, if, if you don't know if chickens will be there next week or this not, it's not so weird that your friend is growing meat chickens. It's actually cool. So, uh, but as we transition to us actually being the cool people, it, what will happen is you feel weird. You feel strange. You feel crazy. You know, I call all our members crazy chicken ladies. We're all the crazy chicken ladies, okay? And just embracing that a bit, but finding community in that. So all us crazy chicken ladies can get together now on Abundance Plus and it, it, it's we have a new uh, format in there that looks just like Facebook. It's not Facebook. It doesn't have those rules or restrictions and, you know, canning posts aren't going to get labeled as extreme and we don't have any of the censorship. You can go in there and feel a little less crazy because everybody gets it. I, we, we went to Homesteaders of America this year, which is an event that happens every year in America. And there were people bare, walking around barefoot. Well, to a homesteader, that's nothing strange uh, that somebody's not <laughs> wearing shoes, right? But to their friends and family back home, maybe that's a little weird that they would have chickens. So when you get around other people like that and you feel less crazy and you feel like, oh, these are my people, this they, they get me. It's frustrating when people don't get you. And when you find a crowd that gets you, that gets you through it. That, that, that keeps you sustainable. Joel Salatin says that the average homesteader doesn't make it seven years. So I think if we're going to get past that seven year mark, we got to find some other crazy chicken ladies and hang out with them online. That's where it starts. But then do enter into the real world. Ask your crazy chicken ladies friends to come over and help you harvest, feed them really nice and uh, get together once a quarter, once a month. And, and we're doing that on Abundance Plus. We have the online uh, avenue, but we just did a worldwide film showing where our members were a host. We had 77 hosts worldwide, and we invited the broader community to come, come to these parties. There were 30 states represented. There were like seven countries, and people could get together in these little parties across the world. And that's getting more uh, appropriate right now. Uh, to where we're not having these big events, but we're having these little, these little uh, parties and these people would come together and just feel a little less crazy. I absolutely love that. And I, I, you've touched on so many things. So although the, the, the blogging to vlogging, the, that transition and how, how you did that started around 2000, 
and 15, it is your family farm. It was, used to be your grandfather's and then your dad's and, and a connection there. And it it's, uh, was in the family and you actually at one point um, bought it. So you've been one way or the other surrounded in, in some re respects to that, but didn't really realize the potential or what, what could have could have happened to that and there is this thing that you brought up that that was really interesting um the crazy thing during this pandemic um there's been a lot of people who want to be crazy they have started to get in these uh mobile homes and turn vans into living spaces buying up in, in Europe, they're, they're going a lot to Denmark and Sweden. They're finding properties, you know, these old abandoned, uh, beautiful historical properties in Italy and in different places and say, hey, uh, I, I can get space for inexpensive and just get away from the rat race, the hustle and bustle of big cities. These infrastructures are not working for me anymore. They're they're not doing it for me anymore. I want to be able to have my, to grow my own food. And there's a key in, in all this madness. A lot of people are realizing growing your own food is like printing your own money. <laughs> there, there is a, a, a not only sustenance, but there's a sense of security when yeah. you have the tools to be able to know to get your basic resources from. Um, and and that, that's the thing is you you've seen the broad spectrum and I don't want to give away too too much of your episodes and and all the tips and tricks because you give away a lot for free I encourage uh, everybody to to go out to abundance plus and if they're at all thinking about homesteading or even want to get the bug go get in there watch a few episodes and look around look at the resources and there's even episodes in there from i can't remember his name on how you can buy property how you can get your own property and how um yeah. for, and i think he calls it for free you know how, how you can how yeah. how can you find your land and stuff what do you need to do um so there's a lot of good tips and tricks but we think or somehow this craziness you know all your neighbors think oh he's a farmer he's homesteading he's doing his own thing i i told you uh, be, at the beginning of our podcast i'm kind of um a biodynamic organic farmer certified so the the crazy guy there i don't know if you've heard of <laughs> Ru rudolf steiner have you yeah. ever read or studied rudolf steiner at all i haven't i haven't tell me more yeah uh, uh, he is the basic the founding father of homesteading He's the founding father of biodynamic organics and is a German guy. Um, he started the whole organic movement. And it's what Demeter now does as, as their organic standard biodynamic organics through, throughout the world. And they're very big in, in the U.S. But the crazy thing is, is he did. I don't know if you've heard about the Waldorf school. Mm. Waldorf School is a schooling system yeah. um, in, in, in Europe, and, but they're all over the world that is just huge. So not only did he teach farming, he taught homesteading, sustenance, he taught schooling. And it was in a different way. And people looked at him like esoteric and really weird and crazy. You know, when if you read his things, the one image on this one book, it's on the agriculture course from him that shows him bearing the, the, the cow horns, right? I love it. Yeah. And, and there, and, and people are like, Oh, that's voodoo, you know, esoteric, that's kind of out there. Um, but there was a reason for that. And it, and it goes back to, to permaculture. You know, you talked about the same place you have the garden is where the chickens are but that's where you have the ducks that's where you have your rabbits poop and have the, have the ducks and the chickens scratching that into the ground you have your sheep and your cattle come come close as well and uh even the uh and somehow on when, when you do your pigs as well that's all turning into cleaning up the soil to making it full of a, a, a healthy biome and you know, my, with mycorrhiza and getting that soil health back up to speed. And um, uh, 
you you mentioned in all of this in abundance plus you've said it a couple times now sustainable Mm. what do you mean by that what 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 do you mean by sustainable help us define that word because i i think i heard it out but i really want to hear it from you again yeah well that's a tough word isn't it because i think everybody has a different definition of it just like everybody would have a different definition of homesteading so i would say i i i'll tell you my most recent journey and my most recent thoughts as a ferocious animal lover and eater i i love them and that's okay i name them and that's okay i harvest them and appreciate them and try to use as much as them well none of it goes to waste if if i don't eat it the pigs or the chickens or the forest eats it so but as as i think about building redundancy in resiliency i was reading Uh, Joel's new book, I edited his his newest book for him uh, in the sense of like trying to bring it down to a, like a homestead. Poly micro. Yes. Poly face micro because he's written from from a marketing standpoint has been doing that for 60 years. He wanted a little bit of help just making sure we're talking homesteading and not going above people's heads. Well, he's, he mentioned that. uh, And I asked him, I asked him right there. Uh, He sits, he sat right there. And I'm getting to the point where I'm closer to 60. I'm 43, so I'm closer to 60 than 20. And now have su- success financially. So I think about the future and, and investment. And hey, Joel, do you do you invest in the stock market? Oh, heck no. If I if I get any extra money, I'm building a pond. So <laughs> so this is this is this is what he's telling me right there. And I'm thinking. Well, you know, that represents he's investing back into the land. And so in his book, he said he invests in resiliency. So that lit up, I underlined it, I put a star by it, and I said, this is probably a pivotal moment in my life. And I hope it is. And so now we're, I already mentioned to you, we're looking into, we're trying to find springs on our property high enough up. What is that about? I mean, we have a wonderful well. We've had it tested. It's clean because I'm looking into resiliency uh, and redundancy, redundancy and resiliency. Because if, because these, these food shortages have then gone to metal shortages or lumber is really high. You know the story. Uh, trading uh, trade you know, ships not being able do, to come in with their containers of goods do you mind if i interject for just a second so you're telling us sustain and you kind of mentioned it you said to sustain sustainability or sustainable to sustain sustain oneself or family with resources well into the future beyond the generations of your kids and their kids, your grandkids, yeah. uh, it's, it's to sustain oneself, it's sustenance farming as well. But then you jumped right in on the resilience. The great thing is, is it does not matter how sustainable you are. If a climate catastrophe, a natural catastrophe comes, that sustainability could be wiped out in one day, in one hour. Yeah. And it takes and on a farm, especially it takes a long time to build up so that you tickled the word resilience from Joel is so amazing because if you have resilience, what does that have? That has automatic sustainability built yeah. into it. And that means the very next hour, you've got energy, you've got water, you've got food, you've got storage, you've got all those things that are giving that resilience. And I'm not talking dystopian resilience that if that happens, we can all don a space suit or a gas mask and we're still living. That's not living for me or for you, I, I don't think. But there's one step beyond that. And I think you're, you, you've you already touched upon this as well, not only in, in the videos that I've seen. Uh, and, and that was my follow-up question to, the, to sustain, sustainable. And that is regenerative, which is beyond resilience. And, and it's not just farming. There's many ways to be regenerative, 
beyond farming or agriculture. And so I, I, that's what I, if you don't mind, I hope I'm not, I don't want to lead or put any words in your mouth, but I, that's what I hear out when I hear you speak. So sustainability is, is kind of like, to me, it sounds like equal, equal, like you're not giving or taking less. I mean, we're getting to a whole nother thing if we talk about regenerative, because that means you're giving back more than you're taking. Sustainability to me is my definition. Seems like it's at least level like uh, you're not giving more than you're taking you're not taking more than you're giving so probably you know a well is not sustainable because it's it's getting piped in through an electric line to be able to run the well okay so we're having to bring in this energy bring this this out, out outcoming energy even even like solar panels i mean you're going to eventually have I, i'm into investing thing in, into things that make me not even need electricity skip alternative energy how about i don't need energy <laughs> that kind of energy so i mean if we're talking about spring i feel like that if if this if if getting our water on the farm was to be completely sustainable we found a spring it's coming out of the water it's coming out of there it, literally in a pinch air, armageddon's come whatever we can walk up there with our hands clasp our hands together and drink from that spring okay now nobody wants to you know we're going to invest in some resiliency and hopefully you know while we can put in some uh, pvc pipes and get this thing piping down to our house Gravi gravity fed we don't need no power our well needs power we have a generator to run if our power goes out you could have some solar panels but those things cor corrode and go bad and are you going to be able to replace them you know people say well plastics with us for 450 years yes but plastics also with us for 450 years so put that pvc under the ground it'll last even longer that's even better how many generations is that 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 spring water could feed how many generations could that spring water then gravity feed our family so then i would love to give you this example if 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 you want to know what i think sustainability is i think it's a rooster i think it's a boar i think it's a bull and a ram in other words for those that don't know what i'm talking about breeding animals like the males of the breeding animals so if we have a rooster and something were to happen we have to a grain uh, shortage or supply chain issue and we couldn't get grain anymore uh we couldn't order chicks from the hatchery anymore we got a rooster and of course we have egg laying hens they can get together and have chicks indefinitely they don't care they don't care the, the sun is shining, the grass is growing. They don't care. They keep going. They don't watch the news, listen to the radio or any of that. They just keep going. And the sun does too. And as long as the sun keeps going, we're all right. So we're on this journey of growing what's closest to our heart. And since we are e eating a lot, and since we're animal lovers, we're going to grow in all the ways in affection and sustenance we're gonna what we're looking at is well pigs use a lot of of grain uh ch chickens take a lot of grain well the ruminants the cows the sheep let's look at the cow because i think it's king i think the cow is king because they give they they eat grass we cannot eat grass as humans i mean we could but it takes more energy to consume it than to than it would give us so sun and grass and the cow can eat this grass and give you our cows, two cows, 100% grass, three to three to four or five gallons a day. Just three gallons is 24 pounds of food. For a family of seven, we could not only survive, we could actually thrive. If, if push came to shove and all we could consume was this meal, we would actually not just survive we would thrive and i believe and they give you 40 pounds of manure every day which which feeds the pasture and regen regenerates it not just equalizes it makes it better and then uh they give you a calf every year at least every year really every 10 to 11 months a calf well so what well you can sell that calf and you or trade it and you've got some tradage going on or you can eat it uh, once it gets one or two years old one and a half so 
you get in a continual flow. And because you have that bull, he can, he can replace himself with his offspring. <laughs> so it's this closed loop. You're not needing this outside thing. And um, I, I don't think, I'm not sure anything beats the cow. So it's then like, oh, how do we get more pasture on our land so we can make that happen? So then we can be less dependent on hay. We, sure, we're grass-fed, but the amount of cows we have, we do have to import some hay. So the next step is then, how do we get more pasture so we can graze them all winter? And then, then this next step. So we take care of water. We have the spring. We have this amazing, the big, you, I mean, if you eat the entire beef, like the, the, the beef liver is the most nutrient dense, beneficial food in the world, hands down. Uh, and you eat in the organs, you have the hide issue. You, you, you could do things with the hide. And um, I don't know if anything beats it. And, and, and because it's going on grass and doesn't need a lick of grain, actually does better without grain. Uh, I don't know if anything, it, oh, now, now you're looking at, okay, we've gotten our water. We've gotten our breeding stock now. How do you, how do you uh, harvest that animal without electricity? Well, it's, it's very possible, but learning how to do that, you know, getting hand saws instead of a sawzall to have them. Uh, how, do you, how do you harvest them without a gun? You know, if, if there was ammo shortage or something like that. So, you know, in Honduras, they would, to harvest a pig, they would, there's no guns there. Uh, it's just not available. It's just an impoverished country. They, 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 they know how to humanely heart, knock out that pig with a sledgehammer. This pig never knows it's coming. Drops, you know, jolts the brain enough. They don't ever feel anything and then, and then slit, slit it. So looking into that, you know, the chainsaw could maybe be argued the most efficient use of fossil fuels there is i mean it's so efficient like like that's <laughs> that'd be the last power machine a true environmentalist would give up because it's so efficient and and so you wouldn't give up your chainsaw but it, it wouldn't hurt to have to learn how to saw by hand if you had have some axes on hand have some splitting malls make sure you have a wood stove to keep warm you see where i'm going with this like a chainsaw makes sense until it doesn't make sense until fuel is just astronomical or not available. And it's, it's, that's, that's where we're going with this redundancy. But if you want a picture of sustainability, it's, it's the cow <laughs> and then learning how to harvest that cow without electricity. And, and look, it, it, it learning how to harvest that cow with like electricity and then preserve it. We just learned because we love the grid. I'll admit it. We, we love it. We have seven freezers. Uh, I know that I, there's a conflict there. I know. And, and I feel it in my heart, but some, at some point we just got to say, we love having this conversation, don't we? And we couldn't do it without the grid. I mean, so can't do it without the grid. Not today. I mean, that, <laughs> See? That, I mean that, there is a solution for everything. It's, it's how, uh, it's how far that do we want to go? I mean, even where you're at in North Carolina, there's you could use ground storage there's even <clears throat> things yes. that you could bury deep enough that would give you the temperatures you need for for yep. the the beef and and the meat that you that you store in those in those seven uh, uh well, freezers that's um, where we're there, going now. It's the, like, the other thing is jerking you know if you uh, if you really don't have electricity but we're not talking about making people survivalists we're making talking about homesteading and and um there's much smarter ways i mean you're talking about this water on your property and i immediately think well <clears throat> what about rainwater cisterns what about ambient water harvesting uh how can you support that natural watershed cycle just on your property of of running down for the wells to give it an extra support every year, uh, one of your episodes, you you had uh, you're standing out in the rain, and and I guess it was a period of some some major rain. Instead of instead of uh, just letting it take its course, what about putting some in some rainwater cisterns or making sure it's channeled? 
when you were at Jeff Lawton's um, course, he has, I think it was last time I was there, there was seven ponds, big ponds mm -hmm. that he was using. They all follow, follow, funneled down from one another. And when it rains there, it's a torrential tropical rain for days and it's like a flood. And so he, he waits till one of the ponds up high gets ready to overfill. And then he takes that PVC pipe and he knocks it down and runs it into the next one and into the next one. And so with that design that you learned, I think um, that's the great thing. You can, that's the, the world's your oyster. You can make that farm and that pearl uh, however you need it to be. And it's just about, uh, well, it's actually cheaper than, than it would be to, to go off of other options. So I think, I mean, and I see that's the process that you're on and I see that's what you you do. And when, when you find a new measurement, you actually go that way. So I absolutely love, you know, what you're talking about there. Yeah, well, we just had a workshop. So, you know, we're in this loving the grid and appreciating the freezers and, and, and what, 60 bucks a year to run one of those things. Uh, but knowing that I want to invest in resiliency and redundancy, we got to have an alternative to the freezer. And so we've got this We've got a boar, which is a, a male pig breeding these sow. So we've got that, and they're going to have these piglets. And uh, but you go to harvest them, and you could let's say you you you, you can do it eat a pig easy enough without a tractor or anything like that. Hand saws, knives, uh, sledgehammer if it came down to if you didn't have a gun. And but then how are you going to store it without a freezer? So we we get stuck in this like. Like it's impossible, but it's not impossible. It's only been possible to do it the way we're doing it for the last few decades, few decades. Uh, so we got Brandon Sheard, a master uh, butcher to come out here and, and he taught us how to cure it with salt. Forget canning even. Like we were gonna go there, like let's learn how to can our meat. But you don't even have to go there. <laughs> uh, evidently you could just, what do we do to cure it? We, we just cured a whole ham and you just salt, you just liberally salt it. Salt it, jerk it, can it. I mean, there's yeah. so many and, options. And the, the, the problem here, here's here. I will address this problem because you, you can go down this rabbit trail and finally say, well, where'd you get the salt? Yeah, because I'm not getting, I'm not getting the, that amount of salt off my land. So at some point, and it's totally okay to rely and depend on a community and have trade. Now, a hundred years ago, before they had the grid here on this farm, well, it wasn't even a hundred years. It was more like 70. Uh, no, not even uh, 50 or 60. And where they get salt? I mean, they, they'd walk or ride their horse carriage uh, down to town and trade for salt. So I think that's okay. I think there's a place for, for relying on community and trade. But then you could go even further and say, where did the Cherokee nation, the Cherokee are the Native Americans who lived in this area. How'd they do it? What'd they do? <laughs> they survived and thrived. What can we learn from them? And, you know, and, and maybe that's where we find some of our uh, resi re uh, redundance, resiliency ideas. We, it's too easy to get caught up in this we got to go to the grocery store and we got to, we could just look back and try to give ourselves some context of how, 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 how did our ancestors do it and pull it off. And like you said, you, you, for Sistine, cisterns, we have this amazing advantage because we have this information available to us and resources. Yeah. It, and I'm talking about invest in resiliency. It wouldn't hurt to, to invest in a, a cistern that would last hundreds of years into some PVC piping to bring the, the spring down. I can totally justify that. That's totally a compromise I'm willing to take, knowing that plastic will be here for a very long time. Yeah, and, that, and that's a different type of plastic. So, I mean, I don't think we need to get rid of plastic. We just need to make sure it doesn't end up in our waterways and our oceans. If it's, yeah. if it's buried in the ground holding rainwater, if it's, <laughs> if, if it's using something of, of value, that's okay. If it's ending up in our air and in the bellies of our fish uh, yeah. um, that yeah. we eat, you know, that's, that's not good, but I, I don't have, you know, no problem with PVC and, and, uh, and all that. I think there's definitely some, some tools there. We, we've kind of diverted 
But we really need, before we're done here, we need to talk about The Rooted Life, your new book, March 2022 is coming out. And I got an, a little advanced copy and notification. You're taking pre-orders. And I, and I believe because of your, your vlog and, and the, your episodes and Abundance Plus, I have a good understanding of what it's about, but I still don't know the full picture. And I'd like you to tease enough without giving the book away before we could even pre-order it or before we can uh, get a copy. Tell us a little bit about it. What led you to that? And uh, what was that journey been like? Yeah, that's good. That's good. So um, I'm a filmmaker, uh, film producer first, and uh, it was DVDs. But who has DVDs anymore? Nobody. I mean, DVDs came and went. Uh, VHS is before that. Books. Books have been with us, I don't know, what, a couple hundred years. They're not going anywhere. And, and, and maybe this all the advances, this new technology and new, all this metaverse talk and all this, this technology is maybe even driving us deeper into books. And there's nothing, there's eBooks, scrollers, but there's nothing that can replace oh, the, the smell, the smell, you know, seeing something you like and underline it. When my dad passed away two years ago, I, I, I went first for his books. And I wished he was more of a reader. He just wasn't. And I, I found one book and he, all the books I searched, uh, it was like he, he had never read them. And I really don't think he did. But I found one and he had one underlined thing in there. And I gravitated towards that because I know I go to underline something. I'm, we're voracious readers, uh, probably a book a week. And uh well i'll underline things and i'll tell my kids when i pass if you want a piece of my soul go to my bookshelf and find the underlinings and that's why i write a book because it's timeless it's a piece of my soul and it will way outlive me a book and so, so this book is about, it's, it's the rooted life, cultivating health and wellness. This is just like a printed out PDF, like real copies are not available yet, even to like folks like you. So uh, we're working on it. It's a long process, but it's a good process and it's a whole team and it's frustrating how slow it can be sometimes, but it's going to be better because it's this huge collaboration and it's going so much better than if I did it myself, as much as I would want to and as much as I can. I could totally self-publish. It's been good to have a team, a good to have different perspectives. Like uh, the, 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 my representative at the publisher, husband thought of this name. I wish I could tell you I thought of the name, but the rude life is perfect because homesteading is a lifestyle. This, just like our vlog, is really the first time. This, this is a book, but it's not a textbook. It's half, I like to think of it half as, lifestyle and practical like what do you do when your spouse isn't on board how do you expose your kids to butcherings uh how do you communicate with your wife and how do you deal with people thinking you're crazy and stuff like that but it also got like it's it's also the no excuse book so there's a, there's a chapter on gardening and it talks about the container garden like when we went on the great america farm tour in 2017 it didn't stop us from growing we were on a converted school bus we literally bought a five inch terracotta pot, put some Vel Velcro on the bottom of it. So it wouldn't slide around, put it in the dashboard. And we got some potting soil and put it in there. And we literally bought some basil seeds and we grew basil. And that was in, where was that Rebecca? Connecticut? Iowa. Iowa. And by the time we zigzag across the US going West, we had us some basil in Wyoming. We harvested the basil and had it on some pizza. And we were eating off the land. And so no excuse container garden too. the bulletproof garden, which is inspired by permaculture. It's basically a mulch garden, which totally bulletproof. Anybody can do it. It's just totally cheap. Put it, on, put it on, any, on top of any kind of soil, sand, whatever. It works. And uh, to the bigger garden, the crop garden, I want to grow more garden. To, I want to have some chickens. 
Remember I said chickens are the gateway? So you could totally, but then there is a permaculture, there's a permaculture chapter in here. Um, I think it's called a smart start. It's called smart start. It's this, yeah, smart start, uh, start no, starting smart. I don't know if there's a glare there, but it's yeah, all about um, the mistakes I made planting the garden 130 feet away. And now my garden's 10 feet away. You know, as Bill Mollison would say, start right outside your door. But I take it a step further and say, start out right outside out the door of your heart. So also grow what you like to eat. You know, we get into it and we think kale's cool. So we, we grow kale, but in our hearts, we don't really like kale. <laughs> so we don't really tend it and, and take good care of it. You know, or you, you seem like a freak if you don't like tomatoes. If you don't like tomatoes, don't grow tomatoes. <laughs> Throw them at the at, 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 at the bad performance. I don't know. Uh, feed them to the chickens. You know, don't don't fall into this pressure. So uh, starting smart and then so, you know, you don't build a house without a plan. So just like you really don't need to do a garden or a home, certainly not a homestead without a plan. But it's not that hard. You just I walk you through making a plan, uh, getting started with a garden, getting started with the chickens. And the hope is then that. Because once you start with it, once you start with the, here, I'll say that again. I lost you. Yeah. Go. Once you start with the, once you have gone into the chickens, you're off to the races. Uh, you've, you've become certainly a homesteader. I'm not saying you can't be before that. Uh, in my opinion, you can be a homesteader and not grow anything. You want to, it's in your heart. So you want to be a homesteader and you're in an apartment in New York City and there's not even a window in your apartment. Go to the store and buy a whole chicken. And, a, and an acorn squash and go talk to Mr. Google Vance to see how, see how to cook that thing. I mean, that's a start. If you won't cook whole foods, then you won't grow whole foods. You know, <laughs> so there's a progression there and you can start even without land or without a seed. And, 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 and if you've got that acorn squash and that chicken and you do have a bit of plot of land, you could save some of those seeds from the acorn squash and, and plant it. <laughs> you don't even have to buy any seed, seeds or anything like that. So this, this will, I've had some people come visit and they've read it and aren't, they're in Washington, they were actually in Washington, D.C. and don't have a garden or anything, but she's reading it and the impression is, it, it makes me feel like I can do this. So she had it, the spirit of, this is maybe unattainable, this is something I can't do or, or think of, but after reading that, no, this is something I can do and even if you can do it and you've been doing it you're going to still have fun reading this because there's fun stories it's not just a guide and a text a lot of fun stories and you're definitely going to learn something i don't care how much you know i think i know who that was or who is she a doctor it's not it's not a secret no no who came there she that was a holistic hilda Holistic it Hilda. It was her daughter from the okay. Wellness, uh, no, Wise Traditions. Wise Traditions podcast. From Wise Traditions podcast. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Um, I want to know. So you're going to actually sign a, probably a thousand copies or something, the first thousand or something. Um, how can people pre-order this? Yeah. How can they get a signed copy? They want to have a little piece of Justin history. Yeah. Uh, uh, there. Um, I'll put the links in the show notes for sure. But can you kind of tell them um, sure. a little bit about that as well? Yeah, we we were going to we we're, we're signing the first 5000. Wow. But we've already done it. I mean, this thing is, this thing is taking off. I mean, we've already sold that many. This thing is hotcakes. This thing is coming okay. in at the right time. This is a, this is a, 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 a very large publisher. This is a mainstream publisher. And that's our hope with it too, is that we would reach the mainstream. Somebody who's, you know, uh, not even necessarily thinking about gardening or homesteading and being in a lifestyle or a home a home section of the bookstore and see this and pique their interest and get it but uh there are advantages to pre-order if you go to the rootedlife.com although we've probably signed the first five thousand uh, 
we sold, sold the first five times for sure because there's so many different retailers and all that stuff. Yeah. So I can't promise signing signed at this at this point, but there are pre-order bonuses. If you go to the rootedlife.com and you you go there, you have a variety of retailers that you can choose to buy from. Uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, others. And then that would be step one. And then step two, you fill in your email address and submit that. And we will get you some pre-order bonuses. We're still working what that is. I think it's going to at least be a chapter from the book before it comes out because the book doesn't come out till March. We'd like to get you something now. Uh, we also did an a audio book version of it. I just spent a week every afternoon doing the audio. That was a lot of fun. And so this is exciting. And, and your community, Mark, the people listening to this, this is what's really exciting about this. This needs to be, much, it already is. It's, it, I've gotten word from the publisher that we've, we've, we've got orders for uh, 20,000. So like, this is crazy. When we, when we Amazing. launched this to my audience, we were number 50 in all of Amazon and books. We were number one in three different categories. It, that, that's, that's hot. And what, what I'm saying is we can leverage our audiences, my audience, your audience, those people listening to this to come together and, and make this big, not, not for my, I don't make the, I, the monetary value here. I could do much better with abundance plus, right? So it's not about the money for me. It's, it's, I'm at the point where we're successful. We want significance. We want to reach the world for this. And when folks like your audience and my audience get in there and we get top 50, on Amazon, well, that and that gets the attentions of the WalMarts and the Targets, and and the Home Depots. Okay, and so then uh, it goes into these mainstream places, the tractor supply, the uh, and then somebody picks it up that might not have heard about it before, and suddenly, you know, we have a lot of problems in this world. Uh, but what is what is is it Jeff Lawton or Bill Bill Molson? Forgot which one said it. But the the, the answers to these problems start in the garden. So yeah. this is our way. When when our community goes and pre-orders this, and it's all about the pre-orders in the publishing business. The the I think it goes to the how many books are ordered pre-order up to a week. I'm not sure. This is my first publish up to a week after the launch is what like the New York times bestseller looks at and all these, all these, these bestseller lists. But if we can get on those because of our, us as an audience banding together and spending the 25 or 28, whatever it is, whichever retailer you're going to, uh, that then gets the attention of the mainstream. And then we get into that mainstream and all of a sudden, more and more people are turning off the news and building gardens <laughs> and the world is a better place. Absolutely. I'll be in the U S come the first part of the year. And um, I'd like to swing by and, and see sure. if we could do a live podcast yeah. Yeah. set up that, that would be nice. Um, it definitely when, when you're big and you're famous and your book makes all the big bestseller list i i, I want us to stay in touch and, and yeah. keep our listeners up to up to speed i, I love abundance plus and definitely will link all those things yeah, in the show you. notes i have um really three uh four more questions for you one more that's probably hard i don't know if you've ever answered it before it's the hardest question i have for you today and it's really um it's for you and you, only you to answer. I don't want to hear what you think political leaders or family or whoever else. I want to know specifically Justin's answer. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you, Justin? I think that's a world. The first thing that came to my mind is abundance. I'm big on shifting away from this poverty mindset and going into abundance. I think the world has enough for us all. And so to, 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 for, for that to happen, I imagine it, it starts with us as individuals. That's our biggest realm of influence. We can't change uh, the big scheme. We can't tackle all these big problems. We can't control that, but we can control ourselves. Like I hinted to you and as uh, Lucas Nelson, Nelson sings, turn off the news and build a garden. So it's, it's, starting with us and 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 i'm talking i'm preaching to myself 
not looking at the world's problem and looking at my problems. When, when somebody on the team messes up saying, well, me as a leader, as a communicator, or as a subordinate, how did I, how could I have done things different to make that better the next time? Sure, this person may have wronged me or made a mistake, uh, but also at least looking and saying, well, what could be my part in that? And kindness, it, it can be easy to forget. Sometimes we get caught up in feelings of revenge, spite, uh, and we just have to try and remember kindness. And that doesn't mean kindness doesn't confront uh, or face hard things or set up boundaries. Uh, it just means we keep that in our mind. And I think as I visited and talked about in my last episode of Rooted, Rooted 10, the secret of happiness. I think we have to definitely take care of ourselves before we can take care of others. If you're on an airplane and you're in a disaster and the oxygen masks come in, you've got to put your mask on first, as backwards as it sounds, so that you can help your child and help others. So we have to take care of ourselves. And I mean getting enough sleep. I mean eating well. I mean trying to live stress-free. I mean getting sunshine and getting cold exposure and, and being active. But I also mean being happy, which is not money, which is not health, which is not success or even significance. It's just being content and thankful. Thank you so much. The last three questions are from my listeners. And they're really, if there was one or two messages that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change your life, what would yeah. it be? Your message, your or messages. Uh, don't be a canter. Eliminate can't from your mentality. I understand Shaquille O'Neal, massive, probably 350 pounds, giant, is not going to race a horse in the Kentucky Derby because those horse riders are like 100 pounds <laughs> or less. He can't. He can't win the Kentucky Derby. Oh, or, or can he? Shaquille needs to say, instead of, I can't win the Kentucky Derby, it's actually true. Like, the, there are limits. But instead, he should say, how can I? Because you might track with me already, and you might see how Shaquille O'Neal can win the Kentucky Derby. I know Derby. how he can. He owns the team, right? He, he owns the horse. He hires the, the jockey. <laughs> <laughs> he does the things to win it. So instead of saying, uh, and I learned this through my chronic illness and, and struggling, I can't go out in the chores. I really can't. I really cannot walk. Oh, wait, grandma's got a walker. <laughs> I'm serious. Grandma, I'm, borrowing, I'm borrowing a walker from grandma. And it was really like, I can't. And I could totally justify this. I could say it to the bloggers. Uh, you know, my, my fans, uh, I, I, I really can't go do the chores today and nobody would blame me for it. I really can't, but wait, how can I? Okay. Grandma's got a walker. Uh, oh, Kubota's give me that side by side. Uh, Rebecca, can you bring the side by side up front? I'll use the walker. I'll get out there and I'll sit in this. I literally did chores from the side by side, probably for a month, just going out there and being a support and making sure the kids did it right and all that stuff. So instead say, not I can't, but how can I? And it, it's, your mind is a wonderful thing. It's a very powerful engine. And it loves these exercises and mull over it and force yourself to say six ways. Oh, I can't go do chores because I'm, I'm 76. Well, how can I go do chores? There was a lady named Gigi that emailed me during these times when I was talking about this. Her, her name was Gigi. You'll never forget her name. Uh, she said, I put an end to 76. I put an end to it. Is she really not 76? She's really 76. There's no getting around that. She put an end to it. 
And in her nice development, apartment, complex, uh, like probably HOA rules out of the yin yang, probably this, this house was looked like what is next to a golf course. It's that nice. She, she sent me a little picture of her green stock garden, which if you don't know, it's like a, a, a tower garden that has 36 planters on it. And it looks beautiful. Yeah. If gardening is against the rules, nobody's going to say anything about this tower garden. You got to put an end to 76 and you got to say, oh, I can't have a garden because it's against the rules. And you got to say, well, how can I? Well, I could petition. Well, I could sneak and have a garden. Well, I could have a, a, a container garden. I could grow something in my window. So I could have lights inside the house and have a, a what do you call those? A, what are those gardens? Without the Sprouting indoor, indoor farm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then you see where I'm going? I could have it. I could go to a community. Is there a community garden in my area? I could go to one of my friends who's out in the country and see if we could collab in a way. Do you see what's happening? Your brain loves those exercises. And chances are you'll find a way and force yourself to write six ideas. And four and a half of them might be stupid. Uh, but one might be great. And, and you might be able, you, you actually, you will be able to do it. What have you experienced or learned in your journey so far in life that you would have loved to know from the start? Yay. Nobody likes this answer. Start documenting now. I wish I could go back. You know, it'd be really neat if I had a plethora of content and documentation from when we started. I know people are getting at, well, what did you do wrong that I could learn from going forward? And I think that's a legit point. I, you know, I made plenty of mistakes, you know, uh, in farming, but w one major one was that I didn't document. For one, it serves as our journal and, and it doesn't have to be through YouTube. It doesn't necessarily even have to be public, but it solved so many of our problems, just like the garden can solve so many of the world's problems. So did documenting. Well, one, we're documenting our, our family and we have these amazing home videos, but we also have this journal to go back to. Rebecca, when did, you know, we're supposed to harvest the ducks at seven weeks. When did we get them? We'll go back and literally look at the vlog to figure out when we when the ducks ducklings arrive. So we harvest them in the right window. But there's also monetary possibilities that may happen because you know Joel Salt Joel Salton talks about the centerpiece of your farm well the centerpiece of our farm our main farm product is not eggs or beef or pork in our exports our main farm product is content that's what we're producing and selling on from this farm so it could turn into a monetary possibility for you and free you up and get you home and be you home be you home with the kids you might reach way more people than you ever imagined but you also will find even if you're on instagram and you you have a hundred people following you this sense of community through comments but also through as we started and this was when we were small people emailing and saying i really related to that hey i'm only two hours. you just said i'm gonna swing by and now all of a sudden i'm hanging out with a german Little old North Carolina hillbilly. <laughs> it's a rich life. That's why we're the so most socialized homebodies anybody know is because we've been willing to put our life out there. Uh, you have to be the change. You can't just sit and mope and, and wonder and look for another community. You have to create it. And that can happen as, as evil or as, as some might claim addictive or whatever social media could be it could be used for that but it can also be used for the good and you'll find that you people were email us oh, you know i'm swinging by can i come meet you yes i mean we were accepting total strangers guys don't even go social media put your spare bedroom on airbnb we did that. Bring, bring your working boots and working gloves exactly we put our spare bedroom on airbnb to pay the rent OK, that's how struggling we were. I was dump, jump, dump, jumping in dumpsters. I was living on food, growing our own food, everything you name, everything you can think of. That spare bedroom paid the rent. And we used to have a map. Well, where is it? We have a map on top of our 
roof. It was on the wall yeah. right here behind me and uh, or right over here. And we would put tax on it from our visitors. And we had visitors from all, we had visitors from Germany. Okay. With a very different perspective on life and culture and uh, uh, what's uh, social studies. <laughs> That's the best word I can think of for it. Social so it's, status. It's like yeah. History also, and, and perspective on, on what's happened in Germany's history and all these kinds of things. So uh, we've had people from Asia and all kinds of places and all over the U S and it paid the rent and we found community and even kept up with some of those people and had them come back and visit. So th thinking outside those uh, 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 that, and so that put my, put my, put in a room on Airbnb and just getting some community and, and they, and that was an option. They could come and milk with us. And when you're milking every day, it gets boring. But just yesterday, we had Rory Feek, uh, singer, songer, uh, singer, songwriter, uh, and his team come. And some of his team came and milked with us. And they had, they, they had no experience with it. And even though we're teaching something, we teach on the vlogs or whatever, and just sharing with them, they're bringing a new perspective, asking fresh questions. And it's just a rich life. And you don't have to have 901,000 followers. You, you even have to be more careful when you, get, <laughs> when you get to that point, but, and you have to guard your time a little bit, but when we were starting off just saying, yes, Oh, this, somebody had picked us up from blah, blah, blah. And they're from Kansas and they happen to be over here visiting grandma. Can they come by? Yes. Because then you're going to sit there with me while I'm milking and I'm going to have somebody to talk to. <laughs> I love it. Justin, thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. Um, that's all I have for you today. Good. We've actually thank went you. way, way over. Um, is there anything else you'd like to contribute or anything you didn't get to say before I say goodbye? Man, I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it. What about you, Rebecca? Yeah, I think it's great. No, you did great. Good job. Thanks so much, Justin. And uh, I hope we can see each other soon and have a talk once again. Okay.